episode 74. This is The Business of Architecture. Helping architects conquer the world. And here's your host, Enoch Sears. Hello, Architect Nation. I am your host, Enoch Sears. On this show, you're going to discover strategies, tips, and secrets for running a fun, flexible, and profitable architecture practice. So thanks for joining us today. It is great to have you here. Now, to get access to training webinars and other insider-only resources, go over to Business of Architecture and join our insiders list. You'll also want to sign up for the early notification list for the Business of Architecture conference. This is going to be the event this year for solo and small firm architects that want to run a more flexible and profitable firm and have fun doing it. We've got a great lineup of speakers, but only those on the list will get first notice with all the deets. So head on over to businessofarchitecture.com forward slash conference and get on the list. Today's show is underwritten with generous support from BQE Software, the developers of Archie Office. So I just want to thank them for their generous support of the show. For over 10 years, Archie Office has been helping architects run firms that are more flexible, fun, and profitable. So thank you, Archie Office, for empowering business of architecture, and we're glad for all you're doing out there to help architects run a more successful business. Check it out at archieoffice.com. Today's guest is Ryan Hansanyuat. Ryan is a licensed architect and the author of the book, A Beginner's Guide, How to Become an Architect. He was recently selected as a finalist for the nationwide business plan competition put on by Charette Venture Group. We had a chance to catch up in Chicago, and I'm glad to have him on the show today. So, Ryan, welcome to the business of architecture. Thanks, Ian. Glad to be here. Yeah, good to have you. So, as I mentioned in the introduction, you are a finalist in the architecture business plan competition, and recently we're out in Chicago to present your business plan to a group of panelists. And I just wanted to ask you, let's talk a little bit about the process of going through that business plan, talk about sure. what goes into a business plan, and sort of where you started this process in terms of your plan. Sure. Yeah, you know, uh, when the first competition came out from, from Shred Venture Group, you know, I was real excited because there's a lot of architecture competitions out there that are very design heavy, but this is one that I felt that I actually had, had a pretty strong uh, case with. Uh, because I have a background in business, I, uh, I was an accountant for a while before I decided to do architecture. My father was an accountant. I've been growing up, going to college to do accounting and business. Uh, so it was perfect for me being an architect and, and being able to write a business plan. I'd written a business, few business plans before. Um, so it was right up my alley to be able to took it, take this architecture firm idea and put it into a business plan for the competition. And where did you start with, where does someone start with a business plan? Yeah, so actually, you know, business plans, they, they first start with, with just the idea of, of just envisioning. Uh, first, first part of the business plan, usually is strategy and vision. Uh, how would you imagine your business plan to be? Uh, for me, I looked at, you know, the things that I was interested in, and I thought to myself, if I could build myself a, a, an ideal firm, what would it look like? And, and the way I look at it as an architect, I look at it, you know, not just from how it run, but the space itself. So I envision my firm being, you know, your standard studio where you have nice design spaces, but I also wanted space in the back that had a place for R&D. Very, I'm very big in technology and gadgets, and I want to be very big on the technology portion of it. So I started with that. You know, how, if, if I could go to work every day in an architecture firm, what would it look like? And, and that's how it'd be. It'd be an office in front, some R&D space in the back, and I get to play with gadgets all day. So the business plan starts with that, and how, how do I make it work? Where's the clients? Where's the markets? That, that comes later, but it all starts with that vision. Awesome. And so then, so take it from there. So clients and market, how do you, you know, you, you have the vision of what you want the firm to be. Yep. How are you integrating technology into the practice? So, so my vision for the, for the firm, what I started was, okay, I like technology, I like gadgets. So I started looking at what's out there, what's currently available, um, what, what's happening. So what I'm looking at is smart homes, technology integration. Um, you know, I'm, I'm looking at custom residential, uh, single family residents, that is very technology rich. Uh, you come in and, and you wake up in the morning and, and your coffee pot turns on. Uh, you don't have carry keys anymore because it's all RFID technology. These are all things that you know they call the home of the home of tomorrow, home of the future. That that are actually home of yesterday. This is old technology, but nobody's really integrating it. So I saw a place in the market. I saw a hole in the market that said, "Okay, I love technology. I love gadgets, but there's no architects that I that I know in my area that are really doing this." So I started looking at, you know, what uh, how would I make it work? Who's out here? Um, you start with your client outreach. So where I'm at, I'm, I'm actually quite lucky. I'm in Austin, where there's a big technology component here. Uh, uh, the tech firms out here, are, they're all coming from Silicon Valley over to Austin. So for me, I'm very much into gadgets. And then I say, OK, well, who are my clients going to be that want this stuff? Well, it just happens that there's a lot of tech firms that would be into that. 
And so, you know, I kind of start with that. There's tech firms out here. Uh, what, what, kind of, what kind of people are, are looking for housing out here? Uh, if you're looking at a tech firm, uh, I, I went to a few uh, demographic um, lunch, lunch, lunch and kind of things, and they were talking about the executive and, and high level uh, tech firms are having a housing shortage right now. So I said, perfect, that's exactly what I'm looking to do. I, I, I want to do technology. There's tech firms out here, but they're moving so fast, there's not enough houses for them. So I started looking at demographics. Uh, in the city of Austin, we have a, a dem dem demographer who's actually paid by city, uh, and he just goes through and tells the forecast. And that's the first place you can go to find out who's here, what, how much they're spending on houses, um, you know, who's growing. Um, start reading newspapers, start reading magazines, just kind of keep your finger on the pulse of where you are, what your market's going to be. So sometimes it's difficult. Sometimes that's a difficult part is identifying the market and making sure there's a little bit of risk that goes along with that. You know, you know are there really people out there that want this? Have you thought about any ways to test that market, Ryan? Yeah, I mean, there's certain ways, obviously. The, the first step is just, you know, using any connections you have, obviously. Um, talk to people you know, and, and you'd be surprised how many connections most people do have. Uh, even if it's just a buddy you went to school with that happens to be a banker, he may know somebody who's a client. Uh, you start looking at home sales. You look at uh, certain markets that are in your, in your price range, for example. Um, how fast are they selling? Talk to real estate agents. Uh, talk to accountants. Um, talk to other architects. You know, see what's going on out there. Uh, you'd be surprised how many people you know that once you ask them, they, they would have the information you need. Um, besides that, you know, you just got to you got to devote time to it. Uh, you got to really take the time to to stay on top of all the news that's going on, stay on top of the demographics. Uh, like I said, I went to a few luncheons where um, they would actually present to the business leaders in the area and, and explain what's going on in the city. So I think the information's out there. You just have to be very proactive about trying to find it and talking to people and, and, and just really making it a, a point to do it because we might get so caught up in designing, we forget to look at what's out there. And, and, and don't worry so much about the design sometimes because you got to have somebody to market, somebody to design too in the market. Yeah. Was there any other places that you went to, Ryan, during your research phase to figure out, feel out the needs of the market? Yeah, for, for me in particular, uh, because I was in the technology area and I'm, and I'm focusing on that, um, there's, there's a lot of... Uh, you know, seminars that happen uh, specifically to technology, not necessarily to architecture. Um, you know, you go to different conferences. We have South by Southwest here, which, you know, has a week long of interactive. Uh, so there's people out there that are involved in technology. And so those are the people, if they're going to be my clients, those are the people I try to talk to. So I, I you know, I go to those things, uh, maker fairs, anything locally, and, and just talk to the people who would potentially be my clients, get their information. And just get to know them. I mean, I'm not even trying to sell them right away. I'm just trying to get to know them, trying to get an idea of, you know, are they moving to the area? Have they moved to the area? Are their employees moving to the area? You know, and just kind of get a general feel for it from those people themselves. Yep. So we have strategy. We have the vision of the firm. Talked a little mm -hmm. bit about finding the market and doing the client research. Yeah. What's next on the list? Uh, next for me, uh, I look at competition. Um, so just because there's a market out there doesn't mean you'll be able to get a portion of that market. Uh, so you got to look at who's in the area. Uh, for me, I, you know, I'm be, be dealing with a local area, uh, so so my area is limited to local architects, and just see who's doing stuff out there that that's interesting. Um, we, I went through the AIA local AIA Austin website, and you know they have a list of firm finder. Find out what other firms are out there. Go to AIA conferences to see what's out there. And what you're looking for is who's doing the same project type you're doing, but also doing the same doing it the same way you are. So for me, example, I'm doing. Uh, you know, kind of smart home system. Who else is doing that type of system? So I was able to identify a handful of firms that have done that in the past. But then you got to think about how am I going to compete with them? And how am I going to differentiate myself? Uh, so I put together a, a chart basically saying, in my area, for, for what I'm looking at, there's certain architects who are doing technology in the homes, but they're not doing it from the get go. And that's not their main focus. Uh, I also have home builders in the area that are offering those services, but they don't do high design. So what I did is I said, okay, well, I'm going to offer high design with the integration of technology, and this is how I'm going to differentiate myself from everybody else. Because it's important to not just kind of understand there's a market out there and be able to serve it. You have to be able to serve it in a way that's different from everybody else. Otherwise, they may not choose you to do the design. Mm. 
I love it. I love it. You know, another thing, Ryan, that makes me think of is the fact that you can differentiate yourself just in the way that you describe what you do. Yeah, yeah. And, and that's also kind of comes into the next phases, too, is, is marketing and client acquisition. Um, part of your service could be more than just, you know, your design. So uh, part, for me, my marketing and outreach was hold, hosting seminars, you know, being at the forefront and saying, you know, I'm, the, I'm the expert in this in this field, I'm the expert in, in, in what I'm doing, and I'm going to give you this free information. I'm going to have you come out here. I'm going to show off how I do it, and that's a free service, but it gets me out there as the expert in, in the situation. So it's a matter of how you sell your services as well as being in the forefront as, of it as well. Hey, Architect Nation. It is great to have you listening in today. I want to remind you that this episode of Business of Architecture is sponsored by BQE Software, the developers of ArchiOffice. ArchiOffice has been powering architecture firms for over 10 years and helping them to be more productive and profitable, which empowers architects to do what you like to do and what you got in this business for in the first place. Create great architecture and spaces. Go check it out at ArchiOffice.com. Now back to our show. Any other uh, insights from your marketing side of your business plan? Yeah, I mean, marketing, it's funny. You could do it a number of ways, but... The, the way that seems to be the most effective for us is just talking to people, uh, just getting out there. And like I said, you know, if we do a, if we do a seminar or a workshop, just talk to people. And, and, and you'd be amazed how many times you get a job but just by saying, hey, I'd love to work with you. What do you got going on? Um, we can get into it a little bit later with the, you know, advancing in the career. But uh, most of our work comes from word of mouth. I mean, you, you will, there, there are new avenues that you're getting into. But just taking somebody to lunch, that, that's a big deal. Uh, having a one-on-one -on -one personal connection with them and you know a big thing now is, is the internet you know uh, Google searches finding people through the internet it's the same thing it's just doing it in a different way because what I mean by that is somebody finds you through Google search doesn't mean they're gonna go with you right away unless they can make a personal connection with you and that's what it really comes down to is the empathy and being able to connect with somebody on a personal level level whether it's through your website or just going to lunch with somebody yeah. You mentioned seminars, workshops, networking, and going to lunch with people, Ryan. Was there anything else that you identified in your marketing plan? Well, one, one area is also just having a sales system because uh, it's one thing to get a bunch of leads. You know, you have a workshop, you get a bunch of business cards, you go to lunch with somebody, you get their information. But until you can convert it to an actual sell, uh, it's going to be hard to get that as a client. So what I, what I put together was a sales system. Everybody can kind of do it their own different way, but... Uh, generally, my sales system is once I kind of get them in, in the in the you know in in the field that okay they're, they're talking to me they may be interested I'll sit down with them and I'll kind of go through the scope with them uh, what exactly are you looking for is this the type of thing you're looking for put some sketches together and just sit down and talk with them and then follow up is there any questions you had how else can I help you hey I got this new technology why don't you come check it out and it's a matter of taking it from that lead into an actual client of getting them to sign for the final proposal. Okay. So when you talk about your sales system, is there anything else about your, the sales system or your particular sales system that we should know? Well, it, it's, for me in particular, it's, it's kind of neat. Uh, because I'm te in technology and gadgets, uh, a lot of things I'll do is, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll send over a proposal with sketches and all the information that I have on there. I'll also include a little QR code that they can scan. And um, what, what they do is I could take my sketches and put it into 3D and do what's called augmented reality so that what, what they're looking at is on their phone or their iPad based on that little marker on there. So it kind of sets me apart from everybody else that they're going to, and they're going to show it to everybody. Hey, look at what I got. Look at this cool thing that I got. And uh, it's going to make them remember me, but it also kind of reinforces the fact that I'm, I'm into this technology and into these gadgets. Um, you could do even things, you know, 3d print a little, little tiny model or something and just something to make them remember you. Uh, so that if they are shopping architects, they're going to remember you more than somebody else. Awesome. Now, uh, well, oh, you talked about the augmented reality. Uh, is that an app you use? Or what what digital tools do you use to do that? Okay, so uh, th th it, it can be a number of ways. Uh, the one the, the way I do it is uh, I build the model in 3D Studio Max, and there's a plugin from AR Studio. Uh, it's it's a it's a plugin you buy. I think it's a hundred bucks. And you take, basically take your 3D model and port it out to this AR plugin, and it gives you a file that you can now put on your iPad or you put on your phone, and it, it, you print out a little marker so that when you print, point your camera, it could be a webcam, your iPhone, your iPad, you point your camera at it, then you'll get the 3D model. 
Um, so, I mean, if we're already going to build the model anyways in 3D Studio Max, all I had to do is add this little add-on, and it already ports it out to it. Uh, there's another thing that I use as well, which kind of gets into operations a little bit, too, that we could talk about, but uh, uh, the, the use of UDK. Um, uh, the video games, Unreal Development, uh, Unreal Tournament, there's a, there's a free software out there called uh, UDK, Unreal Development Kit, that basically does the same thing. You export from 3D Studio Max into this 3D uh, virtual environment, which is they use for video games, and you could take your building and do a, a real uh, live fly-through, walk-through with it, you give your client a remote control, and they can they can walk through just like they're playing on the Xbox. And Those I bet are the you they could things. they could play Unreal Tournament in there too, right? Yeah, yeah, they could, because <laughs> uh, it's really built for gamers. So uh, you have to do a, change a few settings to make it work for architecture. But the the default person has a gun sticking out, so I don't know if you necessarily want that for your clients unless they're into <laughs> that. But That's yeah, nice. it's uh, it's it's a it's taking video game technology and using it for architecture. I guess if you're doing prison design, you might want to be careful with that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, you never know. <laughs> So that's awesome. So the Unreal Development Kit and then the AR plugin for 3D Studio Max. Yep, yep. And, and the, you know, I'm sure there's other augmented reality uh, plugins out there. I, that's just the one I happen to use because that's what I started with. Yeah. Do they do they need an app on their on their iPad to be able to view it? They do. Yeah, they do. And and that also gets into some of my marketing as well. Uh, for a client, what I would do is and sort of, you sort of roll it into the fees. Is I would actually give them an iPad uh, at the beginning of the project with the app already in there. And with obviously my branding on the iPad as well. And what they use is that iPad already has the app, so they get to keep it. But imagine if they're sitting at home in their new home that I just designed. They have the iPad I got them with a with a little marker. They're they're not going to help but show it off to their friends. And mm -hmm. that's how you get most of your repeat clients is showing them showing it off to your friend their friends as well. So it, it's just kind of adding in that that reinforcement of the branding with them as well. That's kind of cool. So you built in a a, um, a viral component. Right. Yeah, it's something plan. they're they're going to want to show off. You know, cuz when you design a house, they're going to, you know, their friends might come over and they'll like the design, they'll look at the house, but then they see something different, something that's new in technology, and especially with the clients that I have, they're really into that kind of stuff, so uh it just kind of adds an extra component. Yeah. So how long uh was your business plan that you put together? How many pages are we talking here? Uh it was 60 pages. Yeah, 60 pages. Oh, wow, that's quite a document, huh? Yeah, but I I tend to get wordy. <laughs> So that probably doesn't help. Um, and, and mine was a lot of words, not too many pictures in it, and a lot of charts and spreadsheets, things like that. But, uh, and, and, but that's, that's the business plan. A lot of people, you can just start with an executive summary, yeah. uh, depending on what you're using it for. And that executive summary for me was, I think, eight pages. But for most people, you could probably fit on a page or two. Yeah. And really what you're trying to do is just get your ideas across on pages that somebody else can understand it. Because if you can explain it well enough for somebody else to understand it, that means you really thought about it and you've thought it through. Awesome. So we talked about marketing. What are we? What are we leaving out? We got operations. Uh, operations and delivery. Step? Yeah. So you know, uh, when I talk about my ideal firm, I, I picture it as a space. You think about that. You know, what's your location going to be? If, for example, all my clients are in Austin, do I need to be in Austin? Uh, what if I live in a small town and there's not enough clients? Is my location? Where is my location going to be? Because it does make a difference to finding clients. Um, you've got to look at your services. What exactly you're going to provide? Are you just providing design? Are you going to do design build? Uh, all the different aspects that go into that, you really need to have set up front. Not to mean, and, and this is another important to, uh, point to make, is that the business plan isn't stuck. You're not fixed. You can always update. You can always change it. But when you first start out, you got to at least say, you know, these are the type of services I plan on offering. Uh, I'm going to do design build, and it's going to be for this type of client. Five years from the road, down the road, you decide you don't want to do it, you can change it. So it, it's, not, it's not set in stone. Um, once you got your service figured out, who's your team going to be? So, Ryan, for you, uh, what what had you outlined for the staff of your of your firm? So, for me, you know, starting out, uh, it, it was just me. Um, as, as I started with the idea that I'm going to grow and have to bring on some people, uh, a project architect and an intern architect in the next couple of years. But I'm in a unique position that a lot of the people that would be doing work for me or for my team aren't necessarily architects because I'm technology rich. Uh, in my in my services, uh, what I identified was the number of consultants that I'd have. They would be under contract for me. So I, ha I identified the people who would, and, and I, I actually identified the actual people that'd be on my team, uh, who's going to who's gonna be a part of it, who's going to help with what, uh, what what's, their, what's their location going to be. Uh, I, I'm very big on debt-free and not having a big office if you don't need to. Uh, so a lot of the stuff being virtual, uh, these people identified they're not in Austin. They're, they're in California. They're in New York. They're in different places. So how is that going to work? I have to, I have to spell it out. 
Uh, we're going to use Dropbox. We're going to use Evernote. We're going to use um, different project management software like Bootcamp uh, to get things done because if they're not in the same office as you, you need to be able to communicate with them. So that's something you should spell out in your business plan. How exactly is it going to work? And then also who, who are, who's going to help you out um, from other aspects? Uh, you know, you don't necessarily need to name your accountant and your lawyer, but just have an idea of who's going to be involved in this so that you already, you've already started thinking about who's going to be a part of the team. Excellent. Where do we go from here? Uh, the last thing for me, uh, and I think probably the most important but also hardest for a lot of people is the financials. Um, you've identified from a very um, quantitative standpoint or, or qualitative standpoint what, what the services are, but you haven't actually put any numbers to it yet. And th this can be the hardest part. So uh, looking at the financial summary, um, if you're a new firm, what's your startup cost going to be? Identify, do you need to get new computers, new software? Uh, do you need to go rent an office? Uh, your, your salary uh, and, and your staff salary. Uh, start looking at what things are going to cost. Uh, insurance is a big one for a lot of people that, that are starting a new firm. Um, or, if you're, or if you're an existing firm, what's your current expenses now and what's your current uh, setup so that you can move forward from there. Um, so you, you, you do your basic startup and then you do your yearly expenses. Uh, when you get down to uh, year two, you do it for the whole year based by quarter and then um, year three, year four, year five, uh, you might start just saying generally this is what I expect the yearly expenses to be. Um, it doesn't need to be as detailed, but for that first year, you should probably have it outlined pretty well. Um, so now you know what's going out. The next step is what's coming in. What's your profit plan? Uh, you got to look at um, what, what, how many hours are you going to work? How many clients could you possibly have? And that kind of ties into your revenue plan as well, is how are you going to actually earn money? Uh, you got you to have a plan in place to, to actually be able to make, to make a profit. Uh, you, so you add your 20%, whatever, 10% you're, you're looking for your profit. And make sure that's included in there so that you know how much money you're going to be making. Uh, so you know how much is going out, you know how much is coming in, that's when you start looking at your profit and loss. So uh, month by month, so for the first month I'm spending X amount of dollars, but I'm earning this, this much mon amount of money. So by the end of the year you know how much is coming in and how much is going out. And again, these are best guesses. Um, you don't always know the exact numbers. Obviously you, you, can't, you don't have a crystal ball, you can't tell how many, how many clients you're going to get. But you, you want to look at it from a, from a best, but really from a worst case scenario is what's the minimum that I can, that I can be looking forward uh, to, toward having because you'd, you'd hate to have your best case scenario and it not happen now that the business is gone. So you got to look at it from a worst case scenario but, and also just from you know, a standard, what, what would I expect to have on here? And you need to have a, a realistic number in there. Uh, so that, that gives you your, your cash flow as well uh, because in any business, cash is king. Uh, you're still going to have to pay rent. And if, you're, if you start today, you find a client tomorrow, and you start working on them, you may not get paid for three or four months. So what are you going to do in that first four or five months that you started a firm to make it float? Uh, you're going to have to pay salaries, or you're just not going to get a salary. How are you going to pay rent? How are you going to pay for everything unless the cash is coming in? So a lot of times business plans, when they start out this way, they start with an amount of money that they're going to need to get started, $10,000, $20,000. Uh, and that's why a lot of business plans, you go to a bank for a loan. Uh, but if you could do it without any debt, you're much better off in the future. But I know it's hard for a lot of people to get started that way. Sure. I'm guessing that you're going the zero debt route. Yeah. So yeah. how much money are you planning on having just to start off? Well, I have, you know, through, through various other side projects I have, I was expecting about 18000 to start out to float me through the rest of the year, assuming that I can get a client right away. I, I get paid pretty soon. Uh, worst case scenario, I could float for you know six months with, without having to get that. But in general, I mean, everybody's going to be different. Again, it's just me, so I have a lot less expenses. And that, that's the key, too, is if you have low debt and no expenses, you don't need as much to start out, and you don't need as much every month to make sure you can make it happen. Yep, yep. Awesome. Well, you know, Ryan, out of going through this process, because you've obviously thought about this a lot before, you've done business plans before, right. what was your biggest aha from this, this process? You know, the funny thing is, what well, first, the biggest aha is that it takes a long time. Uh, you know, whether from this one or from the, la from the last business plans I, I wrote, you, you have the idea, but that's the easy part. The idea is the easy part. It's getting all the financials, getting all your market research together. Um, but what I, what I really kind of found when I was doing this is there's, there's so much opportunity out there. Um, I, I have this idea that I think is a great idea, and I'd love to do it. 
Uh, but the, you know, there were six, there are five other finalists, six finalists in this competition, and getting to see and talk to them after after the competition, see what they put together. Man, there's so many different things that they're able to do, and the things that they're thinking are so different from mine. It, it's encouraging that uh, of the six finalists, we all had something so different out there. And my business plan would work, their business plan would work. So there's a lot out there that you could do. So if you're interested in something, you could probably find a market for it. Yeah, it's a deep blue ocean. It is. Well, Ryan, I know that you're, uh, you have a website, architecturebusinessplan.com. Yeah. That people can go to. You're uh, potentially going to give out some more information about business plans. So people interested in that can go there to sign up. That's architecturebusinessplan.com. Right. And then also, if people want to find out more about you and about some of the books you've written, they can go to architecturecareerguide.com. Yeah, yeah, that's correct. And with the business plan, architecture business plan website, the idea there is just, you know, I get a lot of people asking questions on what goes into it, and I just want to be able to help more people out and figure out something specific to architects because writing a business plan for architecture is a bit different from writing a business plan for somebody else, for an ice cream shop or a, a dry cleaner, you know, those types of things. So. Yep. All right, Ryan. Well, it's been great having you on the Business of Architecture. All right. Thanks, Enoch. You bet. And that's a wrap for another show about the Business of Architecture. To get more resources about how you, as an architect, can run a rewarding business that is both fun, flexible, and profitable, visit businessofarchitecture.com and click the Join button to claim your free account to Business of Architecture Insider. As a member, you'll have access to free tools and resources to help you get more clients, start a new firm, and much more. You'll also get access to my book, Social Media for Architects, where you'll learn how to use Internet tools for fun and for profit. Until next week, this has been The Business of Architecture. views expressed on the show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment except to help you conquer the world. Bump music credit to Ben Folds 5, Do It Anyway.